Well, thank you, Rachel, for uh, counting us in there. And uh, hello, Sarah and Will. As we do each week, we're just going to wait uh, for a couple of minutes while all of the registered participants or attendees join in with us today. Uh, I can see down the bottom of the screen there that uh, people have remembered. They've obviously set reminders because this is uh, an unusually early webinar for us. Normally we do them later in the afternoon. But because Will and Sarah are, um, or Sarah and Will, I should say, <laughs> uh, uh, over in Vancouver, we had to do this so that we could be kind to them and not uh, be making them stay up too late. Um, so we're uh, having an interesting chat today. It's one that I'm quite uh, uh, excited to, to hear about. It's um, the idea of wind vane self-steering and obviously with the Yacht Sales Co and Multi-Hull Solutions for those who have a monohull, this is probably a, a natural fit or a, a logical fit, but it's going to be interesting today to hear how the wind vanes uh, perform and, and operate on the multi-hulls. Uh, so we're looking forward to it. Uh, if we could just jump over to the next slide there. Um, we're just waiting. It's always a bit hard to get the uh, screen to jump forward. There we go. So uh, while we're waiting for everyone to click through, our next webinar will be um, our next webinar will be the uh, destination Tahiti with Mariner Boating. Uh, that's on Thursday, the 22nd of July, so in one, one month's time. Uh, and that is going to be an exciting webinar. We're going to be having uh, the assistance of our friend Stephanie Betts, who lives over in Tahiti and has been cruising over there for many years uh, with Trevor. Uh, and so a lot of people with a lot of experience in being able to talk about sailing in, um, in Tahiti and French Polynesia. Also, uh, we've now had 25 webinars since we first started doing this series back at the start of COVID last year. And you can find all of our recordings of all our previous webinars there on YouTube, uh, on the multi hole Solutions or the Yacht Sales Co YouTube channels. Uh, and they're there and there's some very interesting uh, content now that's uh, useful to go and find that might be relevant to whatever you're looking for. And if we click over to the next screen, just uh, as we always do, we welcome as many questions as you would like to type. To do that, you click your Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, uh, type in your question, and then we will either answer it, uh, we'll interrupt Will and Sarah if it's uh, something that's relevant to the part of the presentation that they're up to, or if it's a general question, we'll hold it over for a Q&A session at the end but we will endeavour to answer all your questions. So if you'd like to click to the next slide. Okay, so I'm Greg Boller. Uh, we host uh, the, uh, these webinars and have been since we started them and in the background managing the presentation today is Rachel. Uh, nice and bright and red, the writing today. So that's who we are. And then if we jump over to the next slide. And there we are. So we're at the start of the presentation. So we'd like to introduce, we've got Sarah and Will Curry uh, sitting there in Vancouver in their office. So welcome and thank you for making the time and uh, for staying up a bit late so that we can do this presentation today. What time is it there, by the way? Uh, it's six o'clock, so. Oh, it's not too bad. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. All right, so what I'll do as I always do is I'm going to stop my uh, video there so that you can be uh, front and center and we'll let you both um, get on with your presentation for the day. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Greg. Really appreciate it. And Rachel for managing things in the background. Now, um, I'm Sarah and this is, this is Will, and we're really excited to talk to you guys today about wind vane self-steering. Um, so thank you for who's here and able to make it live. And um, thank you for watching later if you're doing that. Uh, just quickly, what we're going to go through today, so you know what's coming up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about us and Hydrovane. Um, we'll go through a wind vane 101. So maybe for some people who, who aren't really familiar with, with what it even is, um, the types. And we'll go back to our lovely Hydrovane model here and do a little um, demonstration of, of how to set everything up. 
We'll talk about autopilot, emergency steering, um, and then we'll go through various installations uh, and, and how you would configure it uh, with a focus on multi-halls for sure. And then we'll get to the Q&A uh, if there's any at the end. So some family history. Um, we are, we're cruisers too. Uh, we're sailors. Uh, Will grew up in a family of sailors. Uh, he and his family were cruising when he was in his teens uh, down in Mexico. And then Will and I have actually been cruising together and sailing together for about 10 years, which is crazy. And our boat is currently in Mexico and we've added these two little twin boys to our crew. So uh, we're feeling not as easy as it used to be, but not, not so we're, we're having fun. <laughs> And the history of Hydrovane, so that is actually our family business. Um, the, the product Hydrovane was commercialized back in 1968. So it does, um, does predate us a little bit. And it was a British engineer who came up with the concept and he wanted to come up with um, a type of wind vane that was actually different from the other style that was and is still available, which is a servo pendulum style. Uh, in 2002, which is when our family uh, got involved, so the Curry family purchased Hydrovane, and we manufacture in England, uh, but our office is here in, in Vancouver, so that's where we're, we're actually talking to you from today. Uh, we've done lots of developments, so a lot of people have this misconception that a wind vane won't work on a, on a multi-haul or won't work on big boats. Um, we've done a lot of development in the past 10 years um, to allow Hydrovane to steer bigger, heavier, faster boats. And we will talk a little bit about that. And uh, this is just, I, I like to throw in some beauty shots here. So this is actually Will and I, when we sailed across the Pacific in 2013, um, and this, we were just casually cruising through, through Fiji at this point. And um, just a shout out to Australia because we made landfall in Coffs Harbor and we ended up selling our boat, a Beneteau First 405 uh, down in Sydney. And we just had the warmest welcome from Australians. Yeah. We really felt at home there. So thank you. <laughs> Everywhere we went, people were inviting us over yeah. for backyard barbecues. And oh, it was just awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. We can't wait to get back. And we do know we'll be crossing the Pacific next time in, in a catamaran. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So on to wind vanes, um, the 101, the basics, uh, what is it? So this is a mechanical device um, that steers the boat. That's the primary use. Um, it's mechanical, so it requires no electrical power, which is unlike your, your autopilot to steer the boat. Um, the other main feature is that it steers a wind-based course. So you set it on a certain point of sail and it will keep you on that point of sail until you make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not like an autopilot where you may be plugging in a compass course and it's going to keep you on that um, even if the wind shifts. And of course, it's mounted on the transom. And if you have two hulls, two transoms, you just pick one. Yeah, so it's interesting. When we were coming across the Pacific, we would always sort of do informal surveys at uh, various uh, anchorages where uh, you know all the boats were kind of accumulating. And... This is in uh, Nayafu and Tonga, uh, which is a, a fairly main crossroads. And you can see there's an example of three different veins. So we've got our hydro vein on the left there, which was on our Beneteau. Uh, on an older Nicholson 32, I believe, that you can see an Aries wind vane there, which is uh, a servo pendulum style. And then also uh, next to that, there's a, a smaller servo unit for a 27 foot Allegro. And both those boats sailed all the way from Sweden. The interesting thing, we went around all the boats, there was 26 boats in the anchorage at the time, 19 out of those 26 boats had wind vanes, yeah, active cruising boats had wind vanes, so 19 out of 26 had wind vanes, because a lot of people will walk around their docks and local marinas and say, well, I don't see many wind vanes, people still use them, and the reality is they do, but most of the time, you know, we're selling to customers who are sailing over the horizon, so they're not, uh, not staying put. And of course, if you have a boat for local cruising, you know, a wind vane is uh, not meant to be. So if you go back to the previous slide, mm -hmm. uh, the one of the yacht sailing. So on yeah. that there, if obviously you, you, you're on a, you know, you're sort of on a close reach there. If you wanted to bear away or head up further, that's a matter of just adjusting the, the uh, adjusting the line and you yeah, can just change the sailing angle. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you don't actually go back to the unit itself because once it's engaged, you leave it engaged and you, what you would have is a, a line that runs either down the lifeline so it's not in the way of anything, you're not going to trip over it. And you would just be able to reach it from the cockpit and tug the line as you need to to either bring the vane around so that you're further off the wind or you know head up and bring the leading edge of the vane into the wind more. And that's a really good question. And we'll make sure to show you when we um, come back just how easy it is to kind of rotate the vane um, to, to figure yes. out um, what, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, all right, very good. Thanks. Yeah, so this, this is another good one. Second only to keeping the boat afloat is keeping her point in the right direction. And I think that um, it's interesting to note this because we see a lot of people at various boat shows that we go to around the world that get so caught up in you know, the next fancy gadget that you're gonna add to your boat that's gonna do everything. And of course it's electronic and these things are great. We love them, don't get us wrong, but um, when they fail, it's a different story. So I think it's, it's important to strip all that stuff away and remember that these are the two most fundamental points of preparing any boat for, for offshore sailing. <laughs> so first type, so we got uh, servo pendulums. Uh, this would be sort of a more, there's, there's more manufacturers of this type of wind vane. And essentially what they do is they operate a vane which goes down through to a servo oar in the water. And that servo oar uh, is actually linked through lines that run back to the wheel or the tiller of the boat and steers the boat's main rudder. So it's, it's actually tied into your main steering. So that's, this is a servo pendulum unit. There's some of the manufacturers you might've heard of. There's the Aries, which are now built in Holland. Uh, Wind Pilot, which is a German manufacturer, Monitor, uh, which is in uh, California, Cape Horn, which is a different type of servo unit, and then Fleming, which is in Australia. And I'm not, not sure they're still manufacturing, but uh, I'd be interested to know. Okay, maybe, maybe someone that's listening in today would know that, so we'll see if anyone yeah. can pop in. Yeah. The, um, and actually, Sarah brought up a good point. Yeah, using these on a multi-hull. So uh, they can work. Uh, they'll have their certain limitations. Um, one of them being dealing with superstructure and getting the vein up high enough. Uh, I know, for example, the Cape Horn, they have the ability to get the vein higher with you know, a longer shaft assembly. Um, but the main thing with any servo unit is they really rely on boat speed because that's where they generate their power because they're using the, the servo in the water to actually generate power to drive the wheel. And critical for any servo unit is trying to eliminate friction. So, you know, the longer the run to the wheel, the more blocks that it goes through, the harder it is on performance for the vein. So you want to try and streamline that as, as much as possible. I think another interesting point is that a servo system really has to be mounted center line on the boat. So uh, if you're looking at a mono hull, it needs to be um, center line because you don't want that servo or ever to kick out of the water um, if you're on attack. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that on multi hulls, um, they can be mounted um, in the center. Yeah, they can. They actually can go off center as or well because they, they don't feel yeah. They don't yeah. Feel yep. And then the next type would be a uh, servo auxiliary type system. So this is a, still a servo principle, but it's actually driving its own rudder. So you can see you've got a vane there that drives a servo, which is then linked to its own independent rudder. So your main rudder is fixed. These are uh, few and far between nowadays. Uh, I think they worked well in their time, but they had too many breakage failures. Fleming used to make one. Uh, they abandoned that a while back. Uh, and then Wind Pilot also did it. And as far as we know, they no longer manufacture it because it's expensive to produce and there's too many appendages in the water. Yeah, a little bit complicated. And you're not actually able to, to lift or move that rudder out of the, the water it's, at all. It's so permanent. it's permanently. So it kind of extends your overall length as well. Next type, uh, auxiliary rudder trim tab system. So this is an auxiliary rudder, meaning it has its own independent rudder and it has a vein that is actually directly linked to a trim tab on the back of the rudder. And as it moves the trim tab, the trim tab moves the rudder. So you lock off your helm, get the vein into the wind, 
and the vane actually drives the trim tab, which drives its own rudder. The negative on these, again, is that it is a fixed rudder, so you can't take it off. So you have that permanent structure on the boat, which um, isn't overly conducive to most modern boats with swim step tile style transoms. And then the last one, uh, auxiliary rudder, which is what the hydro vane is, which is uh, essentially its own vane directly linked to its own rudder that gets geared up or down through its uh, own ratio controls. And it actually drives a semi-balanced rudder. So it takes very little power to turn and um, yeah, completely independent from your main steering. And so the vane actually pivots back and forth on a, on a horizontal axis. And uh, that's how it generates the power, which is why the vane itself is so large. Yeah, the difference with the hydro vein and, and the vein being so large is that we're actually getting all of our power from the wind. So we need a much larger vein than uh, some of the other systems do. Now, to fully demonstrate these things, I'm going to actually um, unhook here, stop sharing, and make us uh, larger than life. And we're going to come back and we're just going to show you on the hydro vein itself um, how you kind of set things up and, and how it works. Okay. So I do always do my best here to make sure the computer doesn't shake too much as I hold it with my arms. <laughs> here we go. So here's the remote course setting line. So this is what um, Greg was asking earlier. And basically if you zoom in on the worm gear, Sarah, you can show this is just a, a worm gear. And then this line actually drives through the worm gear to make your course adjustments. So you'd run this somewhere near the helm, runs forward on the boat. We've got a bungee that you just clip it onto, and this gets the vane into the wind. So, so let's say we're sailing uh, on a broad reach. Okay, so broad reach, we're right about here. The boat's tracking this way, right? So we're on the helm, we're getting the boat balanced out. Uh, sail trim and boat balance is imperative for any wind vane, and it is for autopilots too. It's just that with autopilots, we get lazy and we get, you know, less focused on making sure the boat is balanced properly. Um, but you want to make sure that the boat's not overpowered, reef early, don't be pushing the limits all the time, and the vane will do what it's supposed to do. Um, so we're on the wheel, we've trimmed out the sails. We've locked off the wheel. So you actually, with, with the hydro vane, because it's that auxiliary rudder concept, you're actually locking the rudder, not necessarily center line. It's usually off a few degrees to compensate for any helm that the boat has. So if you've got a bit of weather helm, you offset it. If you're having to lock the main rudder way off to one side, then you know that you've got a sail trim issue or a boat balance issue. So it's kind of your indicator to tell you how well the boat is set up and balanced. Wheels locked off. We've trimmed the vein into the wind. So the leading edge here, Sarah, if we can show the vein, the leading edge is into the wind, same with the counterweights. And the rudder is just free trailing at this point. So it's, it's actually disengaged. And what we do is we engage the unit here. So maybe you can ratio. do that once more. We engage. So it's disengaged. So the, rudder, the tiller and rudder are free trailing and engage it. And away you go. We've got different settings here, which I'll talk about in a second, but now the vane's engaged. And so what happens is, as the boat falls off course, the apparent wind changes, which knocks the vane over, which moves the rudder and pivots back and forth. The rudder you see there is not the rudder that goes on the boat. That is we, cut off. We get that question a lot at boat shows. How can that tiny rudder steer my boat? Perhaps a good time to show the actual rudder. <laughs> Here's the rudder. That's composite, is it? It's a nylon, solid nylon. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and so you can see it's semi-balanced, so it's got a fair bit of surface area forward of the pivot, so it takes very little power to turn. How do you take the runner, rudder on and off? Yeah, so when we're coming into port and we don't want the rudder on, we disengage the unit. So the rudder is just free trailing. We lock it, we pin it up here. So it's fixed fore and aft. So it's pinned here. So that's what you would do if you're motoring and you're not using the system. 
keep it fixed. And then you come down here, you either get on your swim step or if you've got a traditional transom, you gotta get a boat hook on here. That's why we weld the pin, the rain onto the end of the pin and the rudder sinks. It's got negative buoyancy, it, it'll drop off like a rock. So you always wanna keep the tether on it. And that's it, rudder drops off, you ship it on board and then vice versa. Normally when you're at sea, you leave the rudder on, you don't touch that. It's only when you're coming into a marina uh, or you know that you're gonna be maneuvering in tight quarters that you would take that off. But most of the time you just leave the rudder on. Now, and, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just back to the earlier point you made about locking off the, the main rudder. Yeah. Does, that, does that work with just a spin wheel lock or do you tie it off or? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, most wheel brakes that come with, you know, production boats nowadays are not adequate for heavy no. conditions. It'll yeah. work for sort of your moderate sailing conditions, but as soon as it gets heavy, you do need a way to have the main, the wheel locked off. So what most people do is they just put a, like a little jam cleat on either side of the wheel and then crisscross the line so that the wheel can be fixed. You need to have the ability to adjust it a bit. So you don't want it fixed in one spot. You want to be able to tweak it and then lock it off as you need to. Very good. And just while we stay uh, there, too, we've just got uh, one. It's not a question, it's a hello. Hi, Sarah and Will. Good to see you. Hope the little ones are doing fine. Uh, waiting to hear if Fred has been all repaired and is in good nick now. Hugs, Jean. <laughs> Jean! <laughs> oh, yeah. That, yeah. Awesome. So, Jean Socrates is actually, yes. um, has been around the world a few times. And yeah. I wish we had your hydrovane, it was literally sitting right here. It's all ready to go. Yeah. Uh, we moved it out of the way for this presentation, but the answer is yes. <laughs> oh, oh, so Fred is the wind vane. Fred yeah. is the hydrovane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you'll, you'll find that um, with the veins take on a personality of themselves and everybody finds uh, a name for them. So they, yeah, yeah it's interesting. <laughs> I'm sure Wilson is a commonly used one. <laughs> yes, you're right, actually. Wilson, we just heard that. Uh, Prince Harry, we've, we've had a lot of that. Harry. Uh, Heidi. <laughs> right, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I'll let you keep going. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Uh, what about the vein? Does do you leave it on or what, yeah. what do you do if you're not using it? So normally, if you're just going to have anchor, uh, some people leave it on, but this vein cover is made of ripstop nylon, so it'll deteriorate quite quickly in the sun. So you usually want to get it off. The quick release knob here, this gets the vein off. It's got height restrictions here, and then you just get it on the back of a cabin door or somewhere out of the sun that's not going to uh, break down in the UV. Gee, it's light, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's about two pounds. Two, two kilos. Two oh, kilos. including the box, <laughs> never mind. Um, what about emergency steering, uh, Will? Because that's something we also get asked about a lot. How would you use this? You know, if something happened to your main rudders or your main, yeah. any part of your steering system, um, how can you use this in, in that emergency? Yeah, so that's kind of a neat feature. So what you do is you disengage the unit and we basically put the ratio knob in the far right setting here. So it's disengaged. And now you put an extension on the tiller. This is one that we supply as an optional item, but some people will just put their own on that's longer or shorter. And you can essentially just use this and drive your boat like a giant dinghy using the, the tiller and the rudder. So that's, that's, uh, that, that's a great benefit just in itself, isn't it? As an emergency steering. Yeah, well, and, and it's interesting because a lot of the you know offshore races and even some rallies, you know, they require that you have an emergency steering capability. So you're really killing two birds with one stone by having the emergency rudder. And then of course you're using it as a vein. We actually get a lot of um, bigger boat owners or, you know, that are using, viewing the hydro vein as a backup to their autopilot. And once they start sailing with it, they realize that the hydro vein is their primary steering source and the autopilot takes a back seat. So it's, it's nice because you don't have to carry as many spares on board because you're not relying on one system. Maybe just uh, really quickly before we go back down, we can just talk a little bit about the different um, ratio settings yeah. um, that are for different conditions that you're sailing in. Yeah, so back to, this is your engaging and disengaging. So you can see here, we've got uh, three different, four different settings in total. So all the right is disengaged. 
all the way to the left is actually your uh, maximum amount of power. So you've got maximum leverage here and least amount of rudder deflection. So this would be your sort of light to moderate sailing conditions. As the conditions pick up, they build, we can go to the two to one, which is the middle setting, or even down to the one to one setting, which is gives you less leverage here, but actually means more rudder deflection. So we can go up to 35 degrees rudder deflection. And you can just show us again, going through those different settings on how they actually affect the rudder as well. Yeah, so here's the light air, 15 degree rudder. So that's your light to moderate conditions. And then here's your heavy rudder. 35 degree more steerage so you got more steerage and less power here because we've got more apparent wind to generate the power so it's a fine tuning thing i do get a lot of people who you know sailed many many miles and say you know by the way what do the different settings do <laughs> these are fine tuning adjustments uh but they do make a difference um, another thing i want to show you too is we do actually have this is a new vein newish vein and it's called the extendable vein and this is very uh, relevant for high speed boats and multi hauls that are going higher speeds and basically the way it works is it's like a like a trombone and the whole vein itself actually moves up and down to increase sensitivity so in light air as we go down or sorry in, in light air as we go up to increase the leverage so we've got you know more leverage and then we bring it down in heavy conditions and you can also incline it all the way down to, you know, 15 degrees above horizontal or all the way vertical for maximum sensitivity. So uh, it's a nice tool for being able to just increase the power and the sensitivity of the vein. Excellent. Okay, I will bring us back over here. One other thing. Oh, one other thing. <laughs> um, I also want to show you, this is actually a, a mounting kit that we have as an option that mounts onto the hydrogen shaft assembly. And this is for the Watt and C hydro generator. So this is a, a product that we distribute and you can see it actually behind Sarah here, but it attaches onto the hydro vein. So you actually have a mounting point for mounting the Watt and C rather than having to drill more holes into the boat. I'm not already familiar with the Watt and Seed. Yeah, so this actually attaches on here. It's <laughs> <That was> awkward. <laughs> that was extremely awkward and not practiced, so apologies. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to go back to sharing my screen here. It's going really well, and that was very, very informative. Oh, good. good. And I just wanted to give another quick shout out to Jean Socrates. And if you if you haven't heard of her before, she's been around the world a few times, and she's actually um, the the oldest woman to have sailed around the world solo, nonstop, unassisted via the Great Capes. So an amazing, amazing feat. Kudos, to her. kudos, big kudos. Okay. Just while we're there, I'll just interrupt with a question from Vicky from Island Cruising. Um, yeah. She said, how about boats with full fold down transoms? Is there a way that the unit can be removed from the transom or do you just remove the vane and rudder? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, depending on the type of boat, and we do talk about drop down um, transom installations a little bit later, uh, we, we go off to the side. Um, so you still have full functionality of that, of that drop down. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of the bigger modern boats that have these drop down tests, those boats are really not designed to be heeling way over on their ears. So some people will look at it and say, oh, you know, it's, you know, four feet off center, it's not going to work. And the reality is it does, because if you're healing more than, you know, 10 or 15 degrees on those boats, you're not going any faster, you're just plowing more water and it's not an efficient way to sail. So we found that the big offsets is really not an issue for us. If you were ever concerned about it, the whole unit can actually be sunk down lower in the water. So the rudder has better immersion, but um, we can get into those specifics depending we'll, on the boat. We'll definitely show some photos um, because that's very common. Um, so we do have a, a quick video here because we're not able to properly demonstrate here. We'll show you on our boat um, of, of how you actually put the hydrovane rudder on. Installing the rudder, doing a good little tip. 
hold up and down. So it's not trying to stay cockeyed, and that makes a big difference to getting the rudder on and off. So I've got it tied off here at all times, very important. Lower the rudder on, get it onto the bottom of the shaft. Wiggle it up, the drain hole on the side will spit the water out. And I've got the rudder pinned up here so that the rudder should be the fore and aft. Insert it in the hole. It should be a tight friction fit. And then get the little R pin lanyard. So when I want to take it off, I just pull the lanyard, pull the pin, the rudder drops off. Because the rudder has negative buoyancy, it's very easy to get off. It's trickier to put on, so you're going to put it on uh, in the marina or at anchor in your dinghy uh, before you leave port. But yeah, simple as that. Hopefully you could hear that okay. But yeah, it is really simple um, to put on, especially if you have have a scoop or, or um, swim a swim step. Um, yeah, taking it off, off is very easy, but you want to do that, um, or you don't want to do that, of course, while you're at sea. <laughs> no need. The sound uh, the is falling. Oh, good. great. Um, the next video here is just a, um, a wind vane in action. So these are some guys who crossed the Atlantic uh, a few years ago. I think they were probably part of the um, ARC rally. And uh, we'll just see what it looks like out there in heavy conditions and how the vane moves back and forth. It's a Hubbard Grassy 43. Right, we're in the process of changing the guard here. <laughs> this is coming out from behind the wheel. <laughs> This morning. What do you got to say for two weeks on the boat, Captain? Great. This is kind of a great beginning. <laughs> oh, I want to get a picture of some of these waves coming up on the side over there. You got the hydro vane, which seems to be doing its job. Oh, look at your look out. <laughs> Two of those come up over the boat. Okay, say goodbye. Goodbye, Dennis. Goodbye. So a decent little ocean swell and um, interesting to note in that video, the, the, the main wheel being fixed. So um, that provides a, a, what I think is a more usable cockpit for sure. Uh, we still have a job when we sail with a wind vane. Uh, as Will alluded to before, sail trim is so very important. So if the wind vane's not working and even if your, your autopilot is just grinding away, um, normally the answer is in the sails. Um, looking at, um, are the sails proportionate? Um, do you need to reef? Uh, with a wind vane, we find, especially for a monohull, using a pole to keep the, um, mm -hmm. the sails full is the really, sails, really important. To keep the sails proportioned and also um, for uh, downwind sailing, deck sweeping sails are horrible. You know, you, they don't, you can't pull them out very well. They don't have very good shape. They're great for sailing around the buoys, but for offshore sailing, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you go with a high cut clue, uh, the boat is actually going to be, it's going to be less weather helm and you're going to get better visibility under the, under the head sole. And th this is primarily for mono hulls, but um, I would think for multi hulls, it would apply as well. And watch your heading. And yeah, why always watch your heading because the wind shifts, you know, the vein's always following the wind, the wind's always shifting a little bit. Uh, but it's surprising, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm constantly going to be tending to the vein. Well, in reality, that's actually not the case at all. You know, when we headed out on our long crossing to the Marquesas from Mexico, we did not touch the wheel for the first 10 days. And we basically just, you know, tweaked the vein as we needed to, but we would go 24 hours without touching anything. And, uh, you know, you're adjusting periodically if, if the um, boat is getting overpowered, you know, you reef down a little bit as you need to, but you're not tweaking it all the time. And then adjusting for conditions. So some veins or some wind vane systems have different veins that you put on depending on the conditions. Mm -hmm. um, for the hydro vane, you're actually depowering it. You're, you're gearing it down like we showed you and you're even raking the vane so that um, it's not going to oversteer the boat. Because everyone thinks, you know, oh, what, what happens in heavy conditions? Heavy conditions are actually easier for a wind vane because there's more apparent wind. Um, so when there's too much apparent wind, you want to be able to, to reduce uh, how it's work, yeah. acting on the rudder. The general rule of thumb is the windier it gets, the better they perform. Mm -hmm. so. 
Uh, we like this slide. So mm -hmm. you, this is kind of your part of the world. Um, this was a passage between Fiji and Vanuatu. And um, you'll notice on that second day, we kind of veered back towards our, our destination. Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually a good example of how following the wind can actually be quite beneficial. We had left Fiji and it, the winds were actually um, uh, come around fairly southerly and we were sort of close reaching, close hauled to close reach and it was kind of uncomfortable. And we were headed for um, Port Resolution in, uh, in Tana. Which is not our Port Resolution or in Vanuatu. Vanuatu. And I, I, we kind of look at each other and say, you know, maybe we should just fall off a bit and make this more comfortable and enjoy the passage and we'll just see where we end up. And so we did. We fell off a bit. The boat was more comfortable. Our boat speed was good. I and think we were heading to Port Vila at that point, Port, which is not where we wanted to go. <laughs> but we just, we were rolling with it. And then literally 24 hours went by. We didn't touch anything. We didn't touch the settings on the vane, the sails. And that was our course. So we ended up, the wind came around, the vane followed it, and we basically went straight into Port Vila. I'm pretty sure we might have sailed, you know, a few more miles, but we were way more comfortable and the boat was sailing, you know, really efficiently. Really efficiently. Yeah, and, it, and obviously the, the, the whole background of this is a, a perfect piece of equipment for long ocean passages where you, you, you've got the chance of that occurring, yeah? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it can be a different story for coastal sailing, but um, even for coastal sailing, you'll find situations where it's, you know, the priority is really the crew and keeping the boat comfortable mm -hmm. rather than trying to really beat yourself to death. And usually when you do that, you know, the steering is nicer. Everything's just nicer on board. So that's why we and, do that in there. And listen, just while we're there, we've got a question from Chris. If the vane is mounted behind slightly offset one meter, to a wind generator, does that impact on performance? Normally the vein is below the wind generator. So normally the wind generators are quite high. Uh, we don't really struggle with dirty airflow from things like that. The main thing is that the vein, when it pivots over on its side, because it has a fairly large sweep, is not gonna hit the pole that the wind generator sits on. So as long as it has clearance, it's not a problem. Uh, dirty airflow is less of an issue than most people think. They, they think, oh, I've got a Dodger and a Bimini and d dinghy on davits and this isn't going to work. When in reality, it actually is not a problem because when you're sailing, the apparent wind is always going to be at least 30 degrees off the bow. And if you're on a multi-haul, maybe more. Uh, and, you know, for downwind sailing, the apparent wind hits the vein first. So it's, it's generally not an issue. And that's part of an installation, planning an installation as well, where we would look at photos and, yeah. and make sure that you're get, that someone would get the, the right shaft length, the right vein, um, because we do have yeah. one shorter and wider vein that is supplied if there might be um, an aerial obstruction um, just like that. Yeah. Every unit is spec for the boat, and that would be the same uh, for every manufacturer. Mm -hmm. They would spec it for based on the boat. So just a question, I've, I've tried to pay good attention, but you talk about the leaning over of the vein. What, what, yeah. So you have a vertical, the, the vein is vertical, as you say, you set it up into the wind. What, what is the purpose or the function of the leaning over? Is it, is it to spill wind in gusts or? No, it's actually to keep you on course, right? It's all sustainable right. horizontal axes. So when the vein, like right, right now you can see, when the vein is standing tall, you're on course. When the vein is flopped over on its side, it's moved the rudder to try and bring you back on course. So it, it's just con it's constantly waving from side to side to keep the boat tracking in the right direction. Gotcha. And it's always trying to return itself to vertical center. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. When it when it's vertical, you're on course according to the vein. Thank you. And I keep switching over to this slide, but I don't want to stay on it for too long, even though it is the truth. We love our yeah. autopilot. We love our autopilot as well. Uh, we have like a hydraulic low deck autopilot, but we really do feel that both of them have their place. And we use our autopilot, um, you know, if we're motoring and sometimes, well, if we're, we're in really squally conditions, squally conditions, and things are gusty, we'll engage the autopilot. In some scenarios, we'll have it engaged in tandem with the hydro vane while we get things under control. But, you know, if we're going on a passage more than, you know, five nautical miles, we're, we're using the hydro van. Um, the realities of offshore sailing, of course, are different when you're doing longer distances. Um, if you are planning to completely rely on an autopilot, the amperage draw is huge, um, especially as conditions worsen. 
Um, so the other factor is the dependence on the other systems. This yeah. is actually Will taking a dive deep back into our aft lazarette before we headed across the Pacific um, and just checking out all of our steering system. And to be honest, we were just so thankful that we weren't completely relying on one steering system. Um, an autopilot for, for me, especially is a bit of a black box, you know, if something failed there, I certainly would not really know how to fix it. Well, I think also more importantly, you know, it's diagnosing and fixing things at sea is very difficult. doesn't matter what type of boat you're on. It's not comfortable, mm -hmm. especially most people feel a little bit off, you know, that you're going to be dealing with some level of seasickness. So it's important to just sort of picture what it would be like yeah. to deal with situations like that. Yeah. And we like to, um, talk about reliability as well, um, because we thought we had quite a reliable autopilot on our first boat, the Beneteau. And um, again, we were in Fiji, we were enjoying ourselves and we were getting ready for that next passage to Vanuatu. And I remember we were in Vunda Point Marina and we had all waited this huge system that had blown through and we, we'd been waiting for about a week. Finally, a weather window came to do the next hop and uh, we checked out of the country. We were heading out um, to the pass and all of a sudden we were motoring and all of a sudden the, the boat just went zoom, like completely a 90 degree shift. And we got back on course and it happened again and again. And we just, we thought, oh my goodness, um, not really sure what to do here. But we felt so lucky that we knew as soon as we were beyond the reef, we were going to be using our hydro vane to steer. So we actually were completely, you know, not dependent at all on our autopilot. And the fact that, that it was broken, um, meant that we we didn't actually have to go back to port and wait for any parts or find someone to fix it. Um, we could just keep going. So this is the ironic thing is we actually never we didn't fix it until we got to Australia. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah this is oh gosh. So this was back in 2013. I love looking at how there were no good grip viewers back then. So this is kind of the grip files that we were looking at. Wind didn't yeah. Anything. Um, and what what we did though is we had a uh, tiller pilot. So that's another really neat thing that you can do with a lot of wind vanes is you can actually set up a tiller pilot. Um, it's very easy on the hydro vane because you can just directly drive the hydro vane rudder. But that became our electric autopilot for motoring. So we had that kind of redundancy and backup as well. And that's a great solution if you want to have an, an inexpensive backup. Those Rain Marine 1000s, they're about $350. Any of them will work and the specs that they're rated for in terms of displacement and boat type, it doesn't matter because it's actually driving the hydro vane rudder, not the boat's main rudder. Interesting. And this is your part of the world. So I don't know if it's as exciting for you guys as it is for all of our North American friends, but the reason we were heading to uh, the island of Tana was to visit, um, visit this. And we'll see if everyone's still awake here. It's hard to get appreciated contour here. That's what we're talking about. Look at that. Holy. Holy, look at the lava down there. That is insane. <laughs> I love uh, talking about the social aspect as well. So if we, if all of our buddy boats had headed off to come to this island and, and hang out on the top of a volcano before us, and we'd showed up like all by ourselves because our autopilot broke and we'd had we'd had to wait for another window weather window, um, I would have been very disappointed because yeah. I was quite terrified. <laughs> sounds silly, but it's true. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So back back to autopilots, you know. I, it's, it's interesting when you look at the complexity of an autopilot system, because it's not just the autopilot itself, it's everything that you use to support it. So it's your charging systems to support it, it's your battery bank to store it, uh, it's all the connections in between, and uh, it, it's fairly complex. So when you look at what a wind vane does in terms of giving you that independence and not being reliant on any other system on the boat, it's, uh, it's pretty valuable. And quiet too. And quiet, yeah. yeah, completely in sync. Um, emergency steering is something else that that we definitely want to touch on. Um, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. I guess that goes for for any passage. Yeah, we we are hearing more and more of rudder and steering failures mm -hmm. all the time, and I think it's just because there's more boats crossing oceans, there's more boats out there, but also because modern boats are 
generally nowadays spade hunt rudder boats so the rudders are more vulnerable to hitting something even new modern hauler grassies they're made with you know spade hunt rudders uh, and in, on multi hulls you're even more vulnerable because you've got less protection in front of them you know depending on the design of the of the cat or the trimaran and you've got two hulls uh, so these are just some uh, examples that's actually our rudder on our boat compared to the hydrovane rudder that's on a Geno 43. The photo on the left is the Motiva 49. It was a Swedish built, very high end custom built boat. And he was in sailing to the Canaries. He was, he was front, leaving, left from the Canaries. He yeah. was heading across the Atlantic. And he was, I think, three or four days out. And uh, in the middle of the night, he heard this bang and came back to grab the wheel. And there was nothing. And the rudder post had just sheared clean off right at the right of the hull so there was no water coming in but he had no steerage and fortunately he had the hydrovane and he went back to it and it steered him you know four or five days down to he got to the cape verde, the cape verde islands yeah. yeah he was very thankful and you know because we are in this business of steering we hear these stories quite often mm -hmm. um of of and, uh, you know, they're, normally they have good endings, I suppose, is, is a good thing if they're a customer. <laughs> but they're not. The interesting thing is a lot of them aren't rudder failures. Yeah. They're actually linkage failures. They're quadrant failures. You know, there's a lot of things in that system that can go wrong. And yeah, generally, like this is a quadrant failure. This is a quadrant one. failure, yeah. I mean, generally, your steering systems are in the worst part of the boat for accessibility. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of get neglected. So it's just. So, so on, that, on that point, uh, Chris has asked a good question because you're talking about moving parts and potential for failure. What about on the actual uh, on the vein itself? What consumable parts are involved? I.e., items that require replacement after a period, example seals or bearings. As in, is there much? Uh, do you get much failure or, or breakage of, of the, the vein itself? Um. We sell an offshore spares kit, so that's something that we supply to most people. Uh, it includes a vein cover, um, which is the ripstop nylon cover, uh, and that does degrade in the sun. It includes yes. a, a couple of the locking pins, so those are for locking the shaft and, and locking the rudder on, um, and those are just subject to metals fatigue. Yes. Uh, it includes a little plastic part that we call the drive sleeve. Um, you know, it's a very inexpensive part, but it does get some wear. And You're probably yeah, ten or fifteen thousand miles before you'd replace that, and then there's yeah. also the bottom bearing on the shaft. We don't even supply that anymore, and uh, it's not yeah. that common. But you will, you do get some wear on it over time. But generally speaking, it's pretty minimal. We see units that have, you know, were built thirty years ago, and they they're still in good condition. Um, we see units that have gone around the world multiple times, and they're they're still looking pretty good. Uh, so yeah, they're 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 made for. A lot of uh, rigorous steering and abuse from the ocean. <laughs> no, very good, good answers. Uh, moving on to installations, because I think people often get their questions answered here. Um, and I love this photo. This is a, a friend of ours, Olivia, and she sailed across the, well, she sailed to Hawaii uh, solo, and now she's in French Polynesia and heading to, to Fiji. She might head your way one day, but um, a really, really neat girl. That's a great uh, shot. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? It's so beautiful. Uh, sounds great, but it won't fit with my boat's davits, arch, gantry, radar mast, transom, etc. Uh, we do hear this a lot. <laughs> uh, luckily, hydrovane is, um, we, we can configure a lot of different things to, to make it work for a specific boat there's, and for a specific transom. There's almost no boat that we can't supply to it's more just a matter of configuring the right configuration so that everything fits and every boat nowadays every cruising boat has some sort of gear on the back that we need mm -hmm. to accommodate so we're pretty used to it uh, in terms of components uh, the drive unit we talk about a drive unit that's kind of the main section of the hydrovane uh, we have three brackets uh, most almost all installations will only use two of them and it just depends on the nature of of the transom we have a shaft assembly, that's what you're seeing here. And those go up in 10 inch, uh, 25 centimeter increments. Um, and, and the length that you need is dependent on the, the freeboard of the boat and any other gear you may have. The rudder is the same for all boats. And then the shaft, or sorry, the vane assembly, uh, the standard vane is quite tall. We have a stubby vane uh, to fit under gantries. And then we also have the extendable vane uh, that we showed you before. 
So there's lots of ways to, to mm -hmm. configure. Uh, many modern boats have swim step sugar scoop. Uh, and the nice thing is that we install off center. So if you like using your platform as we do on our boat, um, a, a great way to install it is just to go off to the side. Yeah, and that, this is primarily for auxiliary rudder systems mm -hmm. that can go off center. Servo units are not really meant to be offset. They might, there might be a few systems that can do very small offsets. But again, as we mentioned earlier, they do have that risk that if the servo ever comes out of the water, then you know you lose all your steerage. So uh, really only auxiliary rudder systems are meant to go off center. And in most cases, it's actually better to go off center because mm -hmm. it gets the hydrogen rudder into cleaner water, less affected by the, the wash coming off of your main rudder or keel or anything else you have below the water line. Yeah. So 80% of our installs are off center. Uh, the big drop down so yeah. uh, off to the side and this boat crossed the Atlantic and yep. they reported back they couldn't find a point of sale it didn't work on so this, this was one of our first big offsets to accommodate a platform and his autopilot died five days yeah. out of the canaries and uh, he wrote us an email when he got to the other side and said hydrovane steered me all the way across so that hydrovane um, was called Prince Harry yeah yeah <laughs> That's a, that's a very good image and a very good demonstration of the offset. Yeah. 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 I mean, most modern boats now with these big platforms, that's kind of what you get. And uh, we're pretty used to it. And as I said earlier, you know, healing is uh, not as a significant issue as some people might think. Multi hauls. Yeah. So here's a a few examples of different setups that we've supplied. Um, it's interesting because you can see how uh, for a lot of them, what we do is we actually have um, an extended heading tube, which puts the top of the vein. You can see in most of those photos, it actually extends the top section, but it keeps the emergency tiller and the controls at an accessible height. So we get everything up higher. Uh, the photo on the left of the older Fontaine Peugeot Belize, uh, that's a good example of going on the inside of a transom. I would have liked to have seen that unit mounted a little bit further aft to maximize the leverage of the rudder because the further forward you go, the less performance you get. They reported that everything was good and they love their hydrovane, but I still would have liked to have seen it further aft. You can also see the two Watt and C brackets coming off of it. So the Watt and C actually just fits into those uh, bracket arms and you can use that as your mounting point. Um, and then the one, the Seawind 1260, this was a recent installation just done a couple weeks ago. Uh, a good example of using the longer shaft, he offset the hydrovane inside on the, on the platform. So you can still use the steps coming up and down the transom. And then the vane is uh, up into clean air above the solar panels. So as you can see, there's lots of ways to configure these. So the Lagoon 40 installation there with the gentleman in the red shirt, is that, is that yeah. a, it's, are you happy with that installation? Because so that looks like it's the, the least obtrusive in terms of uh, taking up step uh, yeah. space with brackets. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, as long as the, the hydrogen is not mounted on the cross beam or, or further forward, because it, the cross beam, you get dirty water issues from the hulls and you lose that leverage. But that's a good example. I like that one because he's, he's angled the arms downwards. Those upper A bracket arms, we really don't care where you position them because you're triangulating the loads over three points. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, finding your attachment points. Mm -hmm. and there's a couple other installations here and here mm -hmm. this one's mounted on the cross beam, but that's a mm -hmm. Pro 50, so a little bit of a older, uh, older design. And uh, I had reached out to a few customers to, to get some really specific catamaran feedback. And I was really pleased that um, the owner, Patrick, of this Nautitech 47, uh, the boat's in Fiji, and he's actually in Port Stevens. But I asked him what conditions um, he used it in. And he sailed from the Caribbean um, all the way to where the no, boat is. Uh, I believe he took delivery in St. Lucia, but we can fight about that later. Um, <laughs> what conditions uh, did you use the hydrovane in? He said, whilst cruising full time, we would use it just about all the time. Um, eight knots was the minimum speed that we would need uh, for it to keep a reliable course in terms of wind speed. Uh, and I asked, did high boat speeds affect the vane's performance? Uh, not really. A cruising cat is generally fairly heavy and shouldn't shoot off at high speeds in the gusts like racing versions do. In three years and 20,000 miles, I never found a limit or a condition where it didn't work. 
Um, and I was asking about the best uh, sail plan for downwind conditions. And just normal rig, main jib or, or main and code zero. Uh, yeah, so that was um, that was really great feedback to hear. And, and this is a, a good installation with the, the, the rudder really yeah. far aft. Um, and then on the other side, the Prout 50, uh, so this boat's currently in Hawaii and they bought it when they were in uh, Panama and they crossed from Panama to the Galapagos and Hawaii using the hydrovane for many, many miles. They found it worked best with the heaviest of winds, 20 knots plus requiring very little adjustment. Um, sail plan is very important um, and they consider it a good tool to teach you how to balance your individual boat. Mm -hmm. Uh, downwind sails also worked great, would not require any adjustments for up to eight hours at a time. And then interesting for coastal sailing, a good point that, um, that Tim made was, uh, we found it even in confused seas close to land, the hydrovane combined with our autopilot on a vane setting worked really well together and reduced our power consumption over time significantly. So that's something that, um, you know, yeah. you can actually do with an auxiliary rudder. If you are in really, really confused conditions, you can actually engage your autopilot mm -hmm. as well on um, kind of a low gain setting and have your vane doing most of the work. But then if for some reason you kind of get thrown off, the autopilot kicks in to bring you back. So we have heard of people doing that um, in those types of conditions. And um, yeah, on, on this boat, actually, the hydraulic steering began to leak after departing uh, Panama. The, the autopilot motor eventually failed. The hydrovane was put to the test, performed well, and it was a blessing that it works as an independent rudder um, because it was not integrated into the, uh, the main steering system. So uh, Tim here rates hydrovane as one of his most valuable, valuable pieces of kit, which was um, really great to hear for a big we, boat like that. We, we didn't pay him to write these. No, emails. we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was asking for multi-hall yeah. feedback, but you, uh, you, these are the answers I got, so you, I'm happy. <laughs> you can actually go on the um, True Stories uh, page of our website, and we've got hundreds of emails, and we try and post it all the good and the bad so people can see exactly mm -hmm. what's what's happening. But mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of good <laughs> feedback there. The, the other thing I was going to say about catamarans and um, you know, any boat that's a high speed boat that's doing high, that's the limitation for wind vanes. You know, if, if you've got a high speed boat that's doing, you know, 15, 20 knots and 20, 20 knots of wind, there's not enough apparent wind for the vane and the, and the apparent wind is changing so quickly that it just can't keep up. So that's kind of where the misconception has come from that you can't do multi hulls. And uh, as we've talked about, a lot of these multi hulls, especially if you're going further distance, you're sailing a lot more conservatively. It's not about mm -hmm. pushing the boat hard and doing your 10 to 15 knots. It's more about keeping the boat all in peace, Comfort. everyone comfortable, and, uh, and, and the vane will steer. So, so heavy boats, um, you know, this was an Oyster 575. Uh, we met the owner at the Southampton Boat Show a few mm -hmm. years ago. and. Um, he had really good results. Mm -hmm. uh, dual hydrovanes is something we've kind of been getting into with even larger boats, so that's interesting. And the lightest, smallest boat we've ever fitted is was a nine-foot boat um, that that left from uh, San Francisco. Yeah. So, so we've done the interesting down. stuff here. <laughs> the dual hydrovanes is for obviously very big, yeah. heavy boats, and it's it's like <laughs> basically two vanes, it's two rudders, and double the power. <laughs> so that's how we get into the real heavy stuff. Okay, um, folks, yeah. I'll just interrupt there. We're, uh, we've come up to almost an hour now, so we'll be wrapping up shortly. But I just wanted to I just wanted to let uh, anyone that's watching today know, just if you've got any more questions to ask, uh, type them now so that we can uh, get, get you the answers before we, uh, before we close off. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so well we are very, very close. So davits, uh, no problem. Aerial obstructions, there was the question before about the um, the wind generator. There's always a way. Um, and, and you'll see there our stubby vein. And um, in terms of what breaks, so this was a great testimonial from uh, Jean-Luc Vandenheed, who was the winner of the, uh, the Golden Globe race. Um, that left from France in 2018. It was around the world, nonstop, unassisted, uh, using only technology that was available uh, 50 years ago. So wind vanes were kind of on display and he won the we, race. We and, wrote him an email after saying what broke. And, and he said, I changed answer. nothing. So that was um, quite fantastic uh, with a, a lot of wear in the Southern Ocean. Uh, cost, of course, is a question. So 
uh, with all wind vanes, you do get this, this other crew member, you get the confidence in your boat, uh, savings on power consumption. Um, often it's a, a once in a lifetime purchase. Yeah. And then if you are looking at an auxiliary rudder type system um, that's not tied into the main steering, um, the ease of operation, um, and of course being emergency rudder and mm -hmm. steering system. It's, it's interesting looking at the cost of it because you'd actually, if you were to say, oh, I'm gonna go get a backup autopilot or I'm gonna mm -hmm. carry spares for my main autopilot, you could spend close to that or you know some sort of figure that's quite high Whereas with the wind vane, you get the vane and you can also throw the little tiller pilot on it to give you your backup autopilot and you also have an emergency rudder. So from a cost perspective, it actually, it's much easier to justify that cost when you look at it from that perspective. And I do hope that I can just squeeze one more little video in here because it's just, it's so cute. This is what our sailing life is like now um, and why we really, really need that extra crew member. Hey, are you so hungry? Did you get your bed at bed to for dinner? Come to the bar. Come to the bar. Kippy, come to the bar. We're serving at the bar tonight. <laughs> Make that diapers about what? Kippy, come to the bar. Come up to the bar for your dinner. Come up to the bar for your dinner. Okay. Mm. So good. Sunset at sea. Sitting over the Baja. Beautiful. Ernie steering. Seas have calmed down. Big fish got away already. But it's really serene considering our situation with the twins. Awesome. Mm, you just want to go and be there, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, not recommended though, sailing offshore passages with twin toddlers <laughs> for relaxation anyways. <laughs> uh, um, so there's our website, um, our emails, and, and we are on Instagram a bit if you want to contact us. And I did want to give a huge thank you to Multi-Hull Solutions, to Greg and Rachel for, mm -hmm. for giving us the opportunity um, and Yacht Sales Company, and then Down Under Rally for kind of connecting us at the beginning of all of this. So thank, thanks to you guys and thanks for everyone who's watching. Yeah, no, fantastic and very uh, well done. And it, it's it's one of those uh, presentations where uh, it, it's just going to be a great resource to have on, on on our YouTube channel because often people don't know that much about how or why or what uh, purpose one would use the wind vane. And, and I think you've just done a fantastic job today of explaining that. Uh, I think there is one more question there. I'm just checking. Uh, Okay, so we've got a client, Chris, who says that he's he's got photos of the hydrovane on a on a Fontaine Bijou Lapari, uh, which is oh. the only one. So uh, and has said if you want them. So I think the answer is yes, Chris. So I think uh, Rachel will will, will uh, contact you and get those. That would be good to uh, see some on the Fontaine Bijou. Yeah, we love so, photos. It's valuable for other people that have the same type of boat. Yeah, so look, folks, that was really good. And we really appreciate a very well put together presentation. You've absolutely nailed it in terms of timing. Uh, so, so we will let you go and, um, and have a great, uh, what, are, what are you in the middle of summer there, aren't you? So it's probably still bright daylight. Oh, yeah. It's hot here. Yeah, we're, we're hitting 30 degrees this weekend. Uh -huh. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. And then Rachel will put the recording up on the YouTube channel in the, in the coming few days. Uh, so um, then if people want to type in and look for it, it will pop up on uh, Google searches and so on. So it's a great resource to have. That's wonderful. We really appreciate it. All right, so thank you very much. And on that note, we will finish today's presentation.